And so you get this fury that here are these Catholics who are organizing, particularly the Irish, who are organizing the cities and winning. And you get the rise of the progressive movement, which is a deliberate effort to replace politics with bureaucracy. And, if, and, and this tradition goes all the way up to present, as, as you'll see in a minute, and, and, and is involved with, with people like Nader and Common Cause, and is an anti-politics movement. Politics is bad. Raising money is bad. Campaigning is bad. Advertising is bad. Organizing political power is bad. What you really want is some nice, elite uh, intellectual, preferably a good Protestant, who will then make the decisions outside of politics. And go back and read the writing of the progressive movement. It is remarkably anti-democratic. And it, it says, we'll do good things by making sure politicians aren't in charge. And Mencken not only had that tradition, but Mencken personally despised people. I think it's fair to say he was a misanthrope. And as you read his, 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 his diaries and his letters, I mean, Mencken came at life from a standpoint of extraordinary cynicism. And he became, for the journalism schools and for much of the modern media, the sort of archetype of the, the good critical cynic who stands aloof from the game and who is all wise and all knowing and all contemptuous. Now, the problem with that is that cynicism combined with moralism to produce anti-politics. So now you have these morally superior people who are inherently cynical who dislike the process of politics. And, and it's utterly fascinating. And let me tell you what the distinction is. And it took the person who helped me first begin to break this was Theodore White in The Making of the President in 1960, where he says of, Schles of, of, of Adlai Stevenson, that Stevenson was like a man who liked the idea of romantic love but despised the idea of sex. And that he was perfectly willing to become president, but he did not want to do any of the things politicians did to become president. It was a wonderful paragraph. When I first read it, I had to stop and think, what is he getting at here? Well, let me draw the distinction for you. And you can listen to this tone, and you'll instantly know whether you're dealing with an elitist or not. It's the difference between liking people and liking the people. I am always suspicious when somebody tells me about the people. Now, you tell me you like people. You're willing to go out and spend time with people. You're willing to sit around a table and listen to people. And it's one by one, because that's how people live. Now you got the makings of a politician. Tell me that you don't really like people because, after all, they're messy and they're confused and they're strange and they have desires. And I mean, it's just, and it's frustrating. It takes hours. People are very time consuming. But as a, an intellectual elitist, you're prepared to help the people. I mean, read editorial writers who love the people and are quite willing to dictate to them exactly how they should live, usually from a morally superior position. But my question to him, there's a great phrase, and, and Martin Luther King Jr. had led his crusade north to Chicago and ran into the last great old political system, which still exists today. And Mayor Daley held a press conference, and Martin Luther King Jr. went to the press conference and said, there are people on the south side who don't have running water. And Mayor Daley said, what are their names? And Dr. King stopped because that wasn't the correct answer. And he said, what do you mean, what are their names? He said, if there are people on the south side who don't have running water, I'm the mayor. I want them to have running water. Give me their names. We'll have somebody down there by this afternoon. They'll get running water. He didn't have any names. He was making a rhetorical statement about the people. This is the, and I'd never thought about it today. This is the essence of the Alaska argument. You can't help the homeless. You can help Sam. So when Sam sits there and says, give me a dime, if you stop and say, Sam, would you like to work for a little while? I'll be glad to pay you 20 bucks, but I have some things that need to be fixed. Would you really want to come and help? If Sam then says, no, I'm too busy begging, you know you shouldn't give him a dime. <laughs> but you've got to stop, focus, and take care of Sam. Now, one of the great books, and, and the reformers will go nuts in my reciting this, but it is a great book, Plunkett of Tammany Hall. Plunkett was a genuine machine politician. He knew how the machine worked. And late in his career, he told a young reporter, this is how we did it. And the truth was, in many ways, if you were an immigrant, if you were Catholic in a Protestant world, if you didn't understand the government, if you had a hard time speaking English, if you were a little scared by the world around you, the big city machines delivered. And they were a world that was different. Now, 
If you want to see what I think is, and, and, and I believe in fiction and in learning things, uh, and if you want to see a great way to learn about it, take a look at Edwin O'Connor's The Last Hurrah. I think we have it on Chiron also. But it, it, it is a great book. This is a novel. It's easy reading. It was a movie with Spencer Tracy. And it's about based on, on, on James Michael Curley, the mayor of Boston, who was once re-elected while, while in jail. Because their theory, their, their theory was the Protestant lawyers had put him in jail, but he was a good Catholic and he was going to take care of him. I mean, part of, part of the reason I'm emphasizing this is, A, it's historically true, and B, as you now look at the rise of black politicians and Hispanic politicians and Asian politicians, this is nothing new. In Benjamin Franklin's time, the fight was between the English, the Quakers, uh, who were English but of a particular religious sect, the Germans, and they had all sorts of ethnic fights in Pennsylvania politics before we were a state, we, when, when Pennsylvania was still a colony. So all of these arguments and all these patterns are not new. In Georgia, the fight between the mountain poor who had their own farm and no slaves and the folks down in the, area, in the plantation area who were very rich and owned slaves, totally different political styles. In Louisiana, you have the Cajuns, you have New Orleans, and you have the North Country, which is Protestant. And it's okay. Part of the way the American system works is you're allowed to have your own particular group to be involved, to be active. And this Edwin O'Connor's book is a great novel about the last great mayor of his cycle and what the machine was like and how it worked and what he did and why he did it. And you'll learn a lot about the process of a free society. As I mentioned, in, in Reardon's Plunkett of Tammany Hall, you really learn how power in a free society really works. And it gives you a real introduction to thinking about it. In the modern period, I can tell it, say as a practitioner, there may be no single novel better about the US Congress than advise and consent. It's about the Senate. But the essence of its lessons on a legislative body are just fabulous. And I reread it in 1990, and I was stunned at how accurate it is and how much. If you read this, it's as, it's as good as any uh, textbook you're going to get. But the people who like politics, the people who understand individual people, remember the difference between individual people and the people, have certain characteristics. People are human. All humans have weaknesses. Politics will involve humans. Politicians will have weaknesses. This is like a geometry set of principles, right? It's important to understand that. So when you have the modern scandal mongering, and, and, and again, I mean, I did file charges against a sitting Speaker of the House. I did move to expel a member who was a convicted felon. I do think there are lines you draw. But the general shock of the news media discovering once again that everybody in politics is a human being, unlike the reporters. <laughs> because, of course, you could have, we didn't do it, but you could have done the Chiron, same Chiron. People are human. All humans have weaknesses. Reporting will involve humans. Reporters will have weaknesses, which is fine. I mean, the glory of the system for a guy like Ernie Pyle, who's the greatest war correspondent of World War II, was he knew that. He recovered the soldiers with a sense of fondness because they were humans. And he was himself regarded by the soldiers with a sense of fondness because he was a human too. And so they had a common bond. They didn't have any sense of either one being morally superior, which didn't mean that they weren't fighting to a moral end. But it was the moral end which transcended them. It was not their personal judgments. Now, a fun book to really get a, a view of this is Franz de Waal's Chimpanzee Politics. Franz de Waal is a, a Dutchman who's now actually at Emory. Uh, this is a study of the chimpanzee colony at the Arnhem Zoo. Chimpanzees are primates. They're social animals. They have hierarchical struggles. The, the book actually starts with a story about a, a male gorilla who is very strong and who intimidates another male and two females so the three of them get so mad at him that they, they, bond, they bond together, and the three of them then almost kill him, and they have to take him out of the cage. 